Hello, this is Andy Sullivan. Today I'm going to take you on a brief tour of oil. All the way from initial production, where it's uh, taken out of the ground, to final consumption, where we put it in a gasoline tank and use it for fuel. Let's start in Williston, North Dakota. Anybody that reads the newspaper in the West uh, has heard about Williston, North Dakota. It's kind of a central hub in the Bakken oil field. And as a little bit of background, uh, the Bakken formation uh, right now is producing about 700,000 barrels a day of oil, and that's growing uh, steadily. It might be 800,000 barrels a day now. <clears throat> and to put that in perspective, that's an enormous amount of oil, but uh, compared to worldwide use or production, uh, which is about 85 million barrels a day, it's only about 1% of what we as a species use uh, in oil every day uh, 85 million barrels a day but one percent of it's coming out of the Bakken formation so that's quite impressive and you'll see in Google Earth here I have a, a image of Williston looks like a nice town here a nice uh, community here and if you zoom out just a little bit and uh, I noticed that the ruler doesn't work right but if you look to the west of Williston and uh, make a ruler which is uh, up on the top it'll make a yellow line for you and you draw uh, out of town only about one mile you'll see a uh, just to the west and just slightly north you'll see a little patch a little square area and if you zoom into that like I am now you'll see that that's a production platform and so that's where we dig oil out of the ground and so that's interesting to look at that now I have uh, about 20 years in the oil industry but in the refining side and I'm not an expert on production uh, refining has plenty to keep you busy for 20 years and so I didn't stray out of that uh, too much as most people don't but I know enough to kinda make a few comments on this uh, production platform and you can see it's a, it's a nice facility here they got it cleared nicely uh, quite a few vehicles here so there's several people working there um, you can see the derrick. It doesn't have a ground view of it, but you can kind of see the shadow of the derrick, so a long derrick. And what they do is there's a bunch of pipes south of the derrick um, stacked up, and they're going to put those pipes up in the derrick vertically, and then they have a machine that will turn that uh, pipe as they put it into the ground with a drill on the end, and they'll pump fluid, and you'll see a, uh, uh, a pit that they've lined with a plastic to protect the environment of some water and they put some uh, chemicals in that water like a uh, clay um, to keep the density right and they'll pump that fluid down in the hole as they're drilling and that'll uh, take the rock chips that they're cutting out of the ground back up and that hole might be a mile deep and so might be more than that and then when they get down a long distance they'll kick that off sideways and they'll go through a shale formation which tend to be kind of narrow and then they'll uh, frack it which gets a lot of attention in the press which is they'll pump high pressure fluid down there water with some clay and some sand in it <clears throat> and they'll uh, make cracks in that shale formation and then the sand goes up into those cracks which hold the cracks from closing again and then that oil can seep out into the hole that's been drilled and they'll produce that oil bring it back up to the surface um, and so that's a big part of oil production right there <clears throat> but as you can imagine when you zoom out a little bit there's not a lot of use for crude oil in that uh, right near that location and crude oil isn't real handy in the format that it comes out of the ground right it's dark it doesn't you know you're not, you're not going to want to put that in your brand new car it's not going to run well it's not going to be good for your car and so that needs to be refined but the first challenge is as you can see there's not any refineries around uh, that drilling platform and so we need to get it someplace and so that'll be either put into a pipeline um, or uh, put into a truck and they'll transport it um, to some place that they can do something better with it, either a terminal where they can load it into a pipeline, or in the case of the Bakken formation, a lot of it goes into uh, rail cars. And so I'm going to click on another link here, and we travel a few miles, and I was able to find this uh, with a little internet search and a little poking around in uh, Google Earth. But you can see this right here, this do long dog track looking thing is a rail loading facility, and if you do your ruler on it, you'll see that it's uh, about 0.7 miles across the long way um, so 1.4 miles around uh, so that's enough to hold quite a few rail cars if you can imagine and you'll see a long building here where you can put the rail cars in 
and then they can load uh, crude oil on the rail cars. Now I was hoping to be able to embed some pictures into this uh, document, but it doesn't look like that it's going to lend itself to do that unless I do screen capture and paste it into a, yet another program. Um, but if I want to keep this true to Google Earth, I can't do that. But uh, if you're interested, you can find all kinds of information on uh, this on the internet. Um, what they do is they make uh, load what they call a unit train, which is a whole train that's full of just uh, oil cars. And each rail car will hold about 500 barrels of oil, so a pretty good amount. And the 500 barrels is 42 gallons. A petroleum barrel is 42 gallons. And so that's about 21,000 gallons in each rail car. And uh, one of those unit trains might have 110 rail cars on it. And so I'm looking at the math here on my calculator. That's about 2 million gallons of oil on that rail car, about 55,000 barrels. So that sounds like a tremendous amount of oil. And although it is a lot, to put it in perspective, the three refineries in Billings each process about uh, 60,000 barrels a day of oil on a good day. So they would each need one unit train a day to keep running, um, 110, 120 rail cars a day. And you can imagine that's a lot of work for a small refinery to unload those uh, that number of rail cars. Uh, as it turns out, most of the oil run in town is uh, processed by a pipeline, which is a more efficient way to transport oil. Um, you have to handle it a lot less. And in the picture you can see uh, a dark uh, rail spur, and then that rail spur will bring it over to Billings, Montana. And so we can take a look, uh, zoom on over to Billings. And we have three refineries in Billings, and I'll start with the one that I worked at for 15 years. I worked a total of 20 years with Exxon, but only 15 at this plant. And um, bird's eye view of it here. And you can see a lot of the round things with the... Uh, white tops, those are tanks, uh, a large tank and a refinery, and I'll zoom into one of them. Might hold uh, 120,000 barrels, so two days of production. Um, this one in the middle that I'm looking at right now was one of the tanks that used to hold feed for the unit that I used to work on, the old cat cracking unit. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but anyway, these tanks hold a bunch of different products. They hold cat feed, they hold crude, they hold finished products um, at different stages of the production cycle. Uh, the crude goes into certain tanks, and uh, some of these tanks are crude tanks here. This one is a crude tank. It's one of our bigger crude tanks, or was. I don't work there anymore. <clears throat> and then you get three crude tanks here. And that crude uh, gets pumped out. Uh, plain vanilla petroleum pumps. They're pretty big, but not gigantic. Maybe 60, 100 horsepower pumps. And it gets pumped into a uh, unit. And uh, our crude unit was over here. And we would pump those through large furnaces, uh, which I have centered in the refine in the image right now. You can see the stacks off the top and where we would burn fuel gas. And the crude oil goes into pipes that surround that furnace, almost like a wall of pipe around the furnace. The fire in the furnace, which is a, a big fire, it's an impressive thing to see, heats that crude oil up. Um, and there's some other things that heat it up too, some heat exchangers. But we'll heat that oil up to the neighborhood of 700 degrees and we'll put it into a distillation column and uh, separate that into different components gasoline and diesel and all kinds of good stuff the stuff that isn't good for processing goes to other units like the catalytic cracking unit which is over here and we would take the real heavy oil that would still be a jelly at room temperature and we would hit that with um, very high temperature catalyst and um, you know the catalyst was about 1300 degrees fahrenheit so we're talking real temperature now and we hit it with a lot of catalyst, about uh, 20 tons a minute of that catalyst. We would heat and uh, contact with oil, and it would crack that uh, heavy oil, which is a chemical reaction, a cracking reaction. It would take large molecules and crack them into smaller molecules. So it would take something like pitch, which has relatively low value, right? You, you don't need too much of that, um, and turn it into good things like gasoline. And then we would send that out for further processing. Some chemicals that come in with crude are smaller than you'd like, like butane. Um, and a refinery makes a lot of butane, but you can imagine the world demand for butane lighters is only so big. And if you're making more butane than you need big lighters, then you got a problem. But there's a chemical solution to that. Uh, algae units will take butane type chemicals, isobutane and butylene, all four carbon uh, molecules, and contact that with a very strong acid. This acid so strong that it'll eat glass, happily eat glass. Um, <clears throat> and it'll react those butanes to make octane uh, type size molecules. That's eight 
uh, carbon atoms. And that's no coincidence that I use the term octane because isooctane, which is a special eight carbon molecule, is by definition 100 octane. And so we can take butane and make 100 octane material out of it. Uh, after we make these gasoline products, we'll hydrotreat them in a, in a process that's uh, called hydrodesulfurization, where we take the, like a gasoline component that might still have too much sulfur for a vehicle, um, and we'll hit that with high temperature hydrogen in a vessel that's got a, a fine catalyst in there. It looks like um, almost about the consistency of some cereals. Um, but it's made out of a hard substrate and it's got metal on it. Sometimes it's platinum in some, some chemical reactions like a power former. But in a hydrotreating reaction it's uh, cobalt, um, molybdenum. Um, and it'll take the sulfur out and uh, make a nice clean gasoline product. And once all these gasoline products are produced they'll go into tanks. We'll mix that up just like you're making brownies into a recipe uh, that makes good gasoline. And then it'll ship out either by truck it, some ships out by rail and some ships out by pipeline. Taking a little walk down the street, we'll take a look at the Conoco refinery. And you can see there's a lot of similarities with the Exxon refinery. The reality of it is, is the processes are essentially the same. All the different sites uh, you know, have certain proprietary pieces of information that they hold sacred. But the reality, in my opinion, of it is... is that stuff is pretty much the same. Um, I don't think there's too much competitive advantage one versus the other. I think they're pretty similar. Um, but you can see the tanks and the processing units. Um, I don't know if we zoom in, we see something real interesting. There's a water treatment plant that you can see from up high um, where they're taking the water, they're putting air in it. You can see the aerators uh, making some froth in the water where you have biological action making that water very clean uh, after it's touched uh, the process which is, means it might have trace oil going in but the, believe it or not bugs love to eat oil and water it's a nu nutrient for them so they'll eat that and uh, keep them happy you can see a rail spur over here where they're loading and unloading rail cars um, and the process units I'm not familiar with their operation uh, but we could take a look at it from the top and see a few things. Some of those look like fin fan coolers where you can take a hot process and cool it down by putting air over it, you know, just like a fan would do. Going down the street a little further into uh, Laurel, you can see the Senex refinery. And again, it's about the same size as the other two. I think they all process about 60,000 barrels a day. That's open information. You can find an oil and gas journal. Uh, and again, very similar. They have a brand new coker, which is kind of nice, shiny new unit. It's interesting, you can see a fire monitor going in this picture. Um, that's usually not a good sign when you have a fire extinguisher squirting on a piece of process equipment. It's interesting that they caught that. They might be doing some training there. I don't see any fire or smoke, um, but they got water on something over there, testing something. Um, the usual tanks, you can see some more air coolers here. You can see the uh, large fans for moving... Uh, air inside that piece of equipment there's water raining down where we're cooling water uh, to cool the process uh, and something else a lot of people don't realize is there's a fourth refinery in uh, Montana a lot of people might not realize it but Great Falls so we'll take a little road trip here locked up there glad it didn't lose my work but here's the Great Falls refinery. It's quite a bit smaller than the three in Billings. I think this only treats about 9,000 barrels a day. But again, very similar uh, to the other refineries, just smaller. And uh, I have a friend that works up there. He used to work with us in Exxon, and uh, he's a tech manager up there now, so he's got a pretty big job up there. And then if you want to take a little trip further away and you want to see what a real refinery looks like, um, we can come down to Baytown, Texas. This is Exxon's, one of Exxon's flagship refineries. I guess they might argue that amongst themselves. This refinery sits on three square miles of land. It's just a gigantic operation. Um, they got two of everything, uh, big units. They got two large cat crackers, uh, each one about probably close to 100,000 barrel a day units. I think the Baytown refinery can process about 600,000 barrels a day of oil um, which is a tremendous amount of oil. And you can see they have the advantage that they can take material not by rail, but they can take it by barge. A barge holds a tremendous amount of oil compared to a rail car. And so it gives them flexibility to get bigger uh, shipments accrued in and products out. 
and all kinds of materials in and out. In fact, they can take ships up the channel. I don't see, well, there's one of them parked right there. And so they'll take a crude oil tanker, not the giant ones, but they can take a pretty large one in port. And you can see that's an impressive piece of equipment. The largest oil tankers now, uh, I don't think they can come into this kind of a dock, but they'll hold four million barrels of oil. Um, and they have to park out at sea and then they'll uh, ferry that oil off with the smaller tankers uh, into ports that can uh, take that size uh, ship. And so you can see the pipes there, pretty impressive. The refineries get quite complex. And then another very large refinery is the Baton Rouge Refinery. I had the good fortune of working down there for about a year in their laboratory. And it's just another massive uh, operation. And again, you can see the docks uh, where they can get some boats that are a little bit bigger than something you could get up the old Yellowstone River. Um, that thing wouldn't make it too far up there. Um, that tugboat is bigger than anything you could get in the Yellowstone River moving that boat. Um, so a little bit of interesting background. Coming back up to the old Exxon refinery in Billings, Montana, we talked about how we get products out. And one of the ways we do that is uh, by pipeline. That's the most effective way because you can move that stuff very uh, low cost. And because you're not touching it all the time, you spill less. You know, you don't have people spilling it. It's not like filling up your lawnmower where about a quarter of the stuff ends up on the ground. Um, and you can, we have a pipeline that goes all the way out west. I think it goes all the way to Spokane, Washington, if I remember right. But here's a terminal up in Missoula. And so that pipeline comes here. And you can take that material out of the pipe and uh, into these tanks and then you can see there's a truck coming in right here to get some oil and so they have a terminal where you can unload that and then that truck will deliver it to something everybody's familiar with is a big old gas station and so this is a gas station I happen to pick up in uh, Missoula and it's kinda interesting the street view is kinda cool and uh, from there you put it in your car and uh, that's pretty much oil from start to finish I uh, hope people enjoyed the little tour. I hope I can save this without it crashing because uh, it takes a little bit of time to do this. But if anybody has any questions, I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, just let me know.